everyone. Um, thank you all for joining. Um, and again, sorry for the video issues. I think we may have them sorted out now. Um, if the other panelists want to try to turn their videos on now um, and let us know. But yeah, so as Stephanie said, I am the Chief Experience Officer here at AMO. Um, and, you know, my uh, experience in healthcare obviously is a little bit different than um, our other two panelists. So um, I think you'll find what they have to share far more interesting, uh, but I provide support to the many um, individuals who are interested in coming, whether they're coming to the United States to complete their um, clinical experience or they're completing a virtual clinical experience. Um, my team uh, is who is here to guide you through that journey. Um, and then uh, I also have the, um, the motherhood side. So I am a mother of two. I have a three and a half year old. And then I just, um, well, not just, I guess four months ago, I uh, welcomed our second um, child. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience, um, just actually like being pregnant um, during the time of COVID and what I experienced, um, like, you know, as far as going to the doctor and my healthcare journey. So that's a little bit about me. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Nora, did you want to go next and just share a little bit about yourself and what you've been up to lately? Or Dr. J, if you want to go, that's fine yeah, too. I can go. Okay. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Ruhi Jelani, and um, I'm one of the. Sorry. I think, okay, I'm one of the preceptors for AMO, and I love working with AMO. I'm a reproductive endocrinology and infertility specialist. Um, I went to a Caribbean school, so I understand how difficult it could be to find a preceptor that can really guide you into the career and the path that you want. So it's been a wonderful experience working with AMO and really nurturing and helping guide um, students from all over. We also have a very robust research department. So I'm the head of research and education at Bias Fertility in Chicago. And a lot of you have been able to partake in these research and um, abstracts and present at national and international meetings. Thank you. And Nora, did you want to share what you've been up to and a little bit about your educational background or connection to AMO? Yeah. Hello. My name is Nora. I'm a medical doctor. I'm originally from Jordan and I'm currently in Jordan uh, working as a general practitioner in a healthcare uh, clinic with the, with the Ministry of Health of Jordan. Um, Two years ago, I uh, uh, know about uh, AMO with uh, Facebook, and I uh, um, I try to uh, to take my rotation. I choose OBGYN in Arizona State, and it was a very uh, interesting experience. Um, I met uh, a lot of people there. Uh, some are students, some are specialists. Uh, all of them are helpful. Uh, I take, I took my chance to deal with patients, to treat them, or even to examine them with a specialist. It was very interesting uh, journey. It was very nice. Um, I acquired new knowledge, uh, and I took a whole picture about it, to be a doctor in USA. It's very good. Uh, I hope I will do it again. Um, just hmm. no, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we're really happy to um, have a role in your educational experience. Um, I guess then my next question for you guys is, um, you know, Dr. Jay and Nora, why did you guys choose the specialties you're going into? Um, I know that you, Dr. Jay, are in um, OBGYN and endocrinology, and Nora, you're looking to go into um, surgery. So maybe Dr. Jay wants to start off with her answer first. Yeah, so I um, have PCOS, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome. I was diagnosed at a very young age. And I was told when I met my endocrinologist at that time that you're gonna need help having babies. And of course you tell a 14 year old that that's not what I'm thinking about. I'm like, sure, whatever that means. I have no period, that's amazing. Um, but until that kind of molded me because I realized she had the ability to help create life. And I asked her, I'm like, oh, is that what you do? 
And she's like, yeah, I help make babies. And I was completely mind blown. I was like, up until I was like, I thought God made babies, but you can make babies too. Um, not, you know, and I was like, this is just so fascinating. And that I want to be you when I grow up. So from that point on, my life's mission became to be a reproductive endocrinologist and impact family, have the ability to help people in need. And um, Kelly, you can speak to this too, like becoming a mother and building a family. It's just being a part of that as a doctor, it will forever be a piece of you, you know? And I just love that feeling. Every day you wake up and you're like, wow, you get to touch lives in so many different manners and aspects that that's what I wanted to be. And so to, in order to be that, you have to be a ob gyne for four years and then do a subspecialty for three years in reproductive endocrine and infertility. And what about you, Nora? Um, you're, you mentioned that you're interested in going into surgery. How did you decide that that was really the area that you wanted to pursue? Um, actually, I, I'm excited I, I'm exciting in working in, uh, in the, the surgery room, operation room. Uh, I think it's a childhood dream. From my childhood, I was playing this game. I'm a doctor, I'm trying to do surgeries. And then I study it, it's very excited. Um, I took a lot of uh, certificates and working with other specialists. So. I feel I can give more efforts for patients and uh, I'm always happy with my work. Uh, even uh, under stressful conditions, I think I can cope with that and work with uh, a with, uh, large number of, uh, of cases. Uh, in country here, we see a lot of patients. Uh, there's um, a huge number. So I feel I can give more and more. So I, uh, I choose this uh, speciality to, to, uh, to take other minor, other subspecialties in surgery. I will not become a general surgeon only. I will uh, continue my career to be more and more and more. That's awesome. Um, yeah, general surgery comprises a lot of different specialties because almost yeah. any specialty, yeah. there's some sort of surgical component to it. Um, or a demand for it. Um, obviously, COVID-19 has been um, just a big game changer in terms of healthcare. Um, what I wanna know is how have your experiences in providing care changed in the scope of COVID-19? And mm -hmm. also for you, Kelly, you know, how has your experience as a chief, exper chief officer experience, um, how has that kind of um, evolved in scope of COVID-19 just because maybe visitors can't travel as much? Yeah, um, I can, I mean, I can jump in. So, um, you know, when this all first started, when, you know, uh, we were informed that um, we would be kind of going into like this lockdown, nobody really knew how long this was going to last. Um, and so we have um, visitors who are planning to come to the United States in um, April, May, June, July, August, September, et cetera. And um, we're, we were really, you know, trying to make sure that everybody who was planning to come, um, you know, felt comfortable still uh, with the fact that um, no matter what, we will make sure that something happens. We will make sure that they get this experience because we know that it is necessary, right? Um, it is important to get those LORs to get that experience um, for whatever is next in your future. So, um, you know, I think something that AMO uh, did really well is not only, um, you know, two-sided, right? We made sure to listen to the concerns. We made sure that we were available to um, answer questions. We let people know that we would support them. Um, we spoke with physicians to make sure that they had everything that they needed um, if they were going to continue to precept um, and just made necessary adjustments. And then we also um, started to transition into this virtual uh, telehealth clinical experiences, um, which has opened up the, the opportunity immensely because people still can't travel or um, you know, clinical sites still aren't open. So you can actually you know, log in from where you are living and uh, meet with your preceptor. 
and I know Dr. J, you can talk a little bit about this as well because you have been hosting this way. Um, and so you're able to log in. Um, it, it, you know, it allows you to continue doing what you were hoping to be doing. Obviously a little bit different. You're not actually, you know, on site, but I do know that our preceptors, um, you know, are taking this very seriously. They're still teaching you the same way that you would be taught if you were there. Um, they're still taking time to answer questions. They're still giving you that opportunity um, to earn that LOR. And so um, that has been something that we have done and transitioned into. And even after, you know, COVID, this is something we still continue, um, you know, we hope to continue on with, so. Um, Dr. J, do you want to speak a little bit about your experience precepting for virtual rotations and then also maybe generally um, how you, the care that you give has changed in the scope of COVID? Yeah, I think kind of um, piggybacking on what Kelly said, uh, when it happened, no one really expected it to happen and how long it should last. And I think we were really swift to transition. We're located in the Midwest, and but we do have offices kind of all over. Uh, the good thing is because we have offices all over, um, we already do a lot of virtual. So I think that transition was pretty easy. We were already set up with the software. I think the hardest thing for me as a provider and for um, was not having a nurse or a support staff at home. So working from home in that transition of care uh, was a little bit harder to get used to because the volume of virtual consults went up significantly, right? You can pack a lot more on in your day, which I learned. Uh, but the good thing is, as an AMO student, you really had an opportunity to learn. I mean, I don't know if any of my students are on here, but they will tell you we started our day at 730 and we don't typically end till six. So you got to see everything like an endocrine, surgical follow-ups, uh, retrievals, IVF. So that day, although it was virtual and you were sitting at home, it was jam-packed. Um, and truly as a preceptor, I really got to see your understanding of your knowledge base. How do you do notes, presentations? We started incorporating a lot more virtual education content. So a lecture once a week talking about it, assignments, um, and also transitioning my research meeting to virtual. So then you got to participate in that and help out any students that needed help and get your names on abstract. So I think one as a do doctor was easy transition, but two, I think it really as for students it opened up a lot more doors that may have not been feasible if you were actually on site, like doing so much in a day. So I think the experience really, the scope of that experience really widened. Yeah, and I mean, um, when you talked about how busy things get during COVID and how it's just kind of changed the amount of things you can pack in. I'm sure Nora can speak to that because she has been in her general practitioner career. She's been treating COVID-19 patients. So do you wanna share a little bit about the certifications that you had to get and just um, how the care you've provided has changed recently? Sure. Uh, actually, there's a lot of strategies, changes in our uh, clinic. Uh, we put new rules for the patients. We treat all patients, and uh, we treat all patients and um, uh, deal with them as they are cases. And all ca uh, um, sorry, not we we um, we put all patients in our clinic in different uh, rooms. Uh, we, uh, we use more workers, we give more efforts, we put new rules like uh, do PCR mandatory and uh, take their temperature, it's mandatory in the, uh, in the reception. And then we uh, try to, to uh, treat them in all directions, not for, uh, um, for their sickness, um, we try to counsel them how to deal with these cases, where with this uh, time, with this pandemic, how to uh, uh, to accept the thing uh, and uh, to protect them uh, from uh, others and to give them a support, psychological support. It's very important in this pandemic. Um, we have uh, we we built new hospitals to put to to put this huge number of patients and to to protect the others and to try to save lives uh, we uh, received just 
the critical cases in hospitals and other clinics receive uh, the other patients to uh, to make their uh, tests or to refill their uh, treatment you know chronic cases uh, they need uh, periodic periodic laboratory tests, periodic uh, treatment. So it's very hard. It takes a lot of effort and more workers for that. Um, I think it's uh, hard, and we uh, we change all our strategies for that. In terms of strategies, um, Kelly, you experienced a lot of those probably firsthand um, as you were preparing to deliver your baby and then during the delivery. Um, can you speak a little bit to your experience staying at the hospital during COVID-19 and maybe how your delivery of um, your newest baby changed um, from when you first delivered a couple of years ago? Yeah, mm -hmm. so, um, so, you know, the experience was um, it was a lot different this time from start till now that she has arrived. Um, you know, we, my husband wasn't allowed to um, attend or come to the appointments with me. So um, whether it's, you know, a husband or a significant other or uh, anyone that you were hoping to, you know, have join you um, isn't actually allowed to come with you, or at least uh, at my, you know, clinic, he was not able to. Um, so, you know, that's something that I think of in perspective of like anybody who's going through this for the first time or is, um, you know, experiencing, you know, um, you know, complications or is um, just whatever the situation may be, how hard that is because, you know, you are, you know, you're going through that by yourself and, um, you know, there's, there's no one actually in there to support you with that. Um, mm -hmm. so was, that was definitely a, a different experience for me. Um, I did have to have um, my daughter while she was in utero, did have to have a fetal um, uh, uh, echocardiogram. And so I had to actually go and do that by myself. Um, and so that was, you know, that was, it was just different, right? You're, you're experiencing so many different things. With that all being said, all of the physicians that, um, you know, I saw were wonderful because they, they absolutely understand um, and they, they want to be there to support you. And they know that this is a challenge and you're in an appointment and you're wearing a mask and, um, you know, you're, you're uncomfortable or whatever it may be. So it's just, it's, there's um, a lot of, you know, empathy, a lot of, you know, emotions, a lot of people. So um, my time in the hospital, um, you know, when I arrived, I had to have a COVID test. Um, and until I got the results back, that was going to determine if I had to wear a mask while I was, you know, delivering my child. Um, and so, you know, you go through that, that process. Um, and then, you know, afterwards, um, I, I did not stay in the hospital as long as I did with my first, um, just because uh, fortunately, it, you know, everything went smoothly. But because of that, um, you know, in order to kind of get us out of that hospital setting um, and not, you know, be surrounded by uh, a bunch of people, um, you know, it's kind of like in and out. And I don't say that in like a negative way. Uh, I just mean that's, you know, some of the, the uh, protocols that they were taking um, in order to keep everybody safe um, and get everybody home um, healthy. So, um, you know, it was, it was, it was an experience, um, something that, you know, I, I could have never imagined uh, would happen when I found out that I was pregnant. Um, and then I guess just in general, like the more so than even like the, the um, first, you know, going through the steps with the physicians and the, the, um, the appointments and the hospital, but you know, it, there's an emotional component to it, right? You're, you're, um, in the middle of a pandemic and you are, you know, about to have a child and you are not really sure what's going on. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's also that side of it. And I do feel that the um, physicians really took that into account and really made sure to just like double, triple check that like emotionally you are doing okay and that you have support and you have people to talk to. And I think that's always important in healthcare, but I, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, with this comes, you know, even more of that and the realization that 
Um, it's not just always about physical, that we have to like be there to emotionally and mentally support our patients as well. That's a really, really good point. Um, I guess kind of going off of that, I mean, obviously all three of you guys have very um, busy professional lives in the healthcare industry, but you also um, are all mothers. So how do you find that kind of like work-life balance? How do you deal with, you know, the struggles of a busy job and then at the end of the work day, having to go home and, you know, again, have these other responsibilities? can start. Um, <laughs> I delegate a lot. So I have um, my mom help me. So not only is she my neighbor, but she's probably the primary caregiver for my children. Um, I love what I do. And I also love being a mom. And I don't think those need to be one or the other. And I think we were as a society bred to say, either you work or you're a mom. And I don't think that's where I think being a working mom makes me a really strong role model for my children and they're homeschooling us. I hear what they do and like my mom helps them with their technical issues. And I see like they were doing um, women's day and my daughter was like, my mommy's a doctor and I'm gonna be like her and she makes babies. And you know, just to see that excitement was like, okay, you're doing something right. So I think um, what I learned over time was society builds this like you have to do both. You don't, you can delegate like, there's nothing wrong with delegating, right? I love to clean, but maybe I don't have time to clean every day. So I get somebody to help me clean my house. Um, and I may not get to eat a home cooked meal every day, but we have a meal prep service that helps. So just kind of eliminating all these things that you're bred to think you have to do to be a good mom, a good wife, a good, you know, a doctor. And then one thing that's really key to know is that you're not gonna be the best at everything every day. And that pressure take that pressure off and that's okay. Like one day I may be a really good mom and one day I may be a really good doctor, but it doesn't have to be every day that I'm the best. So just taking that off of your, you know, it's almost like it's a lot of pressure to live up to. So you don't have to be that you're just human. So do your best and you'll be completely fine. And it's really possible and feasible. Do either of you, Kelly or Nora, want to speak a little bit about your experience and kind of finding balance or um, just kind of managing the kind of professional and personal lives that you guys have? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, I think the most important thing here, the entire feeling to be a good mom and a good doctor together. So you, ha you should have uh, support to, to try to do your best on both sides but uh, it will not be perfect all the time, but you try to, to work in your, yourself with your support, and uh, especially if he's a person with you, or, and try to be a good doctor. You have uh, to, to uh, separate these times. Uh, during work, it's for work. During home, it's for home, and for your baby or for your family. Uh, separate times it's the most important thing here and uh, your entire feeling to uh, always try to do your best in both things yeah absolutely I mean I, I think I'll probably just piggyback on um, what you know both said but um, there's I, I think there's this um, this feeling of guilt sometimes right that you um, you know I'm I can't bake the, I'm not going to be the one that makes the homemade cookies for my child's, you know, school. I'm, I am not the one that's probably going to make a home cooked meal every single night, similar to, you know, what Dr. J said. Um, it's just, it's, it's not realistic for my lifestyle, but that doesn't by any means mean that I am not a great mom and that I can't, you know, love my kids just as much as everybody else. Um, and I, I love what I do. I, um, you know, I am, uh, you know, what am I trying to say? I, I want to work. I want to help people. I want to be there to support, you know, others in their journey, um, you know, in the healthcare system. And so it's something that I, I plan to continue to do uh, while uh, my children grow up. And um, so, somehow it's, you know, we need to help others um, get rid of that. 
and I think Dr. J said this as well, just like society has kind of created that, right? Um, and so, you know, just helping others to realize that that it, that's not, that doesn't have to be there, that doesn't have to exist, that you can do both things um, or, you know, more than both things. You can do multiple things and, you know, be great at all of them. Um, and there will be failure at times, but that's okay. Um, and I think just one thing to note is like, especially in a time of COVID, um, and Nora, you said this, is like separating the two, right? It is difficult to like separate that, that <laughs> and life right now, because where I'm working from home, um, my kids do go to daycare. So that helps um, because they're out of the house. But for anybody whose kids are in the house, um, but also like when they get home, my computer's still here, right? So if somebody sends an email or a message, it's very easy to just go to it and that separation isn't there all the time. Um, so, you know, I think that is something just important to note, um, especially during a time of COVID for those people who are, um, you know, experiencing that. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a challenge for sure. One thing that you mentioned, Kelly, that I kind of want to circle back to is um, you said that the reason you know that you decide to work and have um, a family life is because you really do enjoy the work you do and you like helping people. So this is a question for all you guys, you know, what are the most challenging and rewarding parts of your jobs? Mm -hmm. Can I speak to something Kelly said? I love that she yeah. said that it makes, so what I told myself is we were bred to think balance, um, but it doesn't have to be a balance because the balance doesn't mean X at five, I stop this and I do that. It's what fits for you. Um, and like Kelly said, you have the, and like she's like molding somebody's future. Like how rewarding is that to see somebody be a part of AMO and then fulfill their dream of being a doctor, being a healthcare provider, being whatever it made that they desire. Just like that for me, I was like, it takes me two seconds to send like, but I've been on the receiving end of that of where I've been a patient. I was like, somebody just please answer my like email or my text. It's 5 p.m. I know, but fertility is very time sensitive. And when you're in the heat of things, when you're applying and you need an LOR, it feels like your life is going to come crashing down if you don't get what you need like right now. Um, so I think having that power to control and to help somebody and so impactful, like you, I really, that reward, that feeling that you get, I can't even put that into words. Um, I forgot your question. I'm sorry. I got so distracted by Kelly. Oh my God. Like I think that you just made a really great point that like, it doesn't like balance doesn't necessarily mean 50, 50, you know, some days it can mean 80, 20, which is totally fine as long as you're comfortable with it. And then, you know, there are going to be other days where it's the opposite way, you know, it'll be weighted differently. Um, but my question was, um, going back to Kelly's thing that she really enjoys her job and that's why she chooses to kind of like work and have a family. Um, I'm sure that you guys love what you do. Otherwise you wouldn't be in it. So what are some of the biggest rewards and challenges that come with your jobs? For me, the most challenging part is not being able to help somebody, um, a failed cycle. Like it's devastating for me, probably as much as not, probably not as much as them because once again, I know what it feels like to be a patient, but it's equally devastating. And that makes that lack of control and fertility is probably the most challenging for me. Like, I don't understand it. It's not in our textbook. It's not what you're taught. You, you're bred to think of an embryo. You have lining, you put it together and you get pregnant. It's for me, it's not, it's like, unlike any other medicine where you don't know. And I wish I had answers to tell my patients like why it happened. And it makes me feel like, there has to be an answer. Let me help you find this answer. Let me try all of this. Um, and I think that's where my research brain kicks into gear. And that's why I like research because there's so much unknown, but that's probably the most challenging. And the most rewarding is being able to answer that why and actually help them achieve their dream or get that closure as to why this is happening. Because I think a bit, in addition to wanting a baby, a lot of patients want to know why. Um, I wanted to know my why, like why, if you keep saying I have eggs and tubes and sperm, like, why am I not getting pregnant? Why? Um, and I think that's really important. And I, I think that's also an aha moment that I really look forward to, to help explain that. Great. Yeah. I think that, um, you just touched on some very, very common themes. I think maybe Nora will have similar answers. Nora, what are the biggest challenges and rewards of your job right now? 
the biggest challenge uh, as I'm a mother and I'm a healthcare worker, I have to be uh, uh, um, there a suff to have a sufficient uh, and a lot of information in my field of specialist specialization to give all people or all patients the desired uh service what they asked about uh, so i have to read all the time and uh, at the same time i have baby and uh, he needs me and i can't guess when he cry or when he want to feed or or something like that so and i uh, have a lot of exams so i have to read i have to know i have to help people in the uh, right way and exact uh, and give them the exact the exact thing that they have to take. And the rewarding thing when the patient become happy and he's good and uh, he, he, he leave our clinic happy and uh, I treat him as soon as possible and uh, relieve his pain, you know that. Yes, just like that. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, I, Steph, I mean, I know I kind of already answered it because the question was kind of built off of it, but um, you know, obviously um, one of the biggest challenges for us right now is COVID. Um, you know, and that we have no control over that, but it doesn't make me feel any better when, um, you know, we can't help somebody um, with what they're trying to accomplish right now. So, you know, it, it doesn't make me feel better that I have to say, you know, your program or, um, you know, hospital sites are shutting down because of COVID and ho hopefully, you know, we're moving, um, you know, out of that uh, and more into, um, you know, I, I think we see, I guess I'm trying to say, I think we see a light at the end of this tunnel, hopefully, um, but, you know, things that are out of our control, um, it's hard, uh, like visas, for example, um, you know, when somebody is very excited, they're planning to come and then they um, are denied their visa for whatever reason that may be. Um, I, we can't control that, unfortunately. And so we try to do everything we possibly can, whether it's getting, you know, a letter um, from a physician to support and we provide a visa support letter. Um, we will provide coaching and, and how to, um, you know, handle your visa appointment, what to bring and those types of things. But, um, you know, when when we can't go there and actually physically get it and then, you know, get somebody here uh, to the United States, that's a challenge um, for me. But that is why we, you know, did transition over to this um, virtual, these virtual opportunities, because then it does allow us to control it a little bit more. Um, and then I guess just, you know, most rewarding, um, a, a perfect example of this would be recently, uh, you know, the match, um, results came out and we received so many people who reached out that were past visitors just saying thank you so much for everything that you did to help this journey. Um, I matched uh, an internal medicine at, you know, X, Y, and Z. Um, and hearing those stories, hearing those success stories and just, um, you know, receiving this uh, just excitement um, is everything. Like that is, that is truly everything because we know that um, you know, they are, they are accomplishing what they're hoping to, and they're, they're reaching their goals. And that's just a really awesome feeling. Yeah. Success stories. Definitely. I think for all of us, they really are why we do what we do. Um, and you know, if you're still, um, you're watching and you're kind of looking, um, to have your own success story, like Kelly mentioned, we do have virtual rotations, but even though COVID is still going on, we are offering about 200 in-person rotations where, you know, they're very safe and our preceptors have guaranteed that they have, you know, the PPE in place and there are certain measures they're taking to keep themselves, the patients and any of the visitors who come. So um, you can definitely feel comfortable, you know, rotating um, and talking to our advisors about your concerns if you're thinking about planning your own rotation. Um, so I guess we'll pivot a little bit and kind of talk about some of the inspiration that you guys get um, and where you get it from. Um, do you guys have any role models that you look at um, that kind of, you know, make you look forward to furthering your education and your practice in healthcare? I 
I can start. Um, I, so my reproductive endocrinologist was diagnosed me, became a mentor to me. So this was now in the early nineties and it was, I think just becoming an official field with a board certification. It wasn't an official field yet. Um, so she, every year I would go to her for my annual and she'd tell me, oh, it's a one-year fellowship and then it became a two-year fellowship and then it became a three-year fellowship. But every day she kind of kept tabs on me and to, would tell me like, you need to do this and you need to do that. This is how you're gonna become a fertility doctor and this, it's really competitive. And so she became kind of a lifelong mentor. Um, I told her I'm gonna come work for her one day and I did. We She stayed on until she retired in her late seventies, early eighties. And I practiced with her for a year. So it was amazing to be able to practice with somebody who's been so into influential in my career. And I picked up a lot of research mentors, very similar to kind of what AMO offers. And I think um, having that opportunity to be exposed to such a diverse um, subset of physicians is amazing. I did not have something like this. So I was cold calling doctors, like somebody, can you help me do research? Can you help me do research? And you know, not a lot of doctors have time or won't, will answer their emails. So I found a couple mentors that way, but I really like that AMO facilitates that. And I think that's how you find a lot of your mentors. Cause if it wasn't for the mentors I found by doing that, I don't think I would be where I am today. What about you, Nora? Um, do you have any like really strong mentors or role models that you look up to who have kind of helped you on your medical education journey? Um, actually, there's no uh, specific person for that. Um, I don't know. Maybe my my dream, my feeling that I'm a doctor and I will be a good doctor. I have no specific person for that. But uh, when uh, I um, experienced the AMO uh, rotation, uh, I'm in love working in USA. Uh, um, I love the uh, the hospitals, the way to treat people, to see patients. So uh, I encourage myself and try to do my best to take my speciality uh, or to be, become a doctor and uh, uh, and take take my uh, speciality and become a, a, a old uh, woman, old woman, old doctor, <laughs> working all the time. So it sounds like a lot of your inspiration is just drawn from your experience yes. with the U.S. healthcare system and just mm -hmm. the ideal version of a physician, which is, um, I think, similar to a lot of people. Um, obviously, the healthcare industry, um, women have continued to grow and become a more, um, a larger part of, you know, the physician workforce. But I think that there is still a lot of room for growth in terms of women in healthcare holding leadership positions. Do you guys have any advice for women who might want to hold leadership roles in medicine in the future? Um, I can jump in real quick. So, um, you know, I strongly recommend um, finding a mentor, uh, you know, having somebody to talk to. Um, whether it is, you know, in the specific field that you're looking to go into, or, you know, just somebody that you really look up to, um, they can be, you know, they can be wonderful as far as like providing guidance on how to move up in your career or, you know, how to ask for certain things, but they also can just be, um, you know, a sounding board, someone to bounce ideas off of, to, to really like talk through things. So, um, I yeah, strongly recommend finding a mentor. Um, I do think that that helps. And then just in general, like, um, you know, I think being passionate or, you know, wanting to be of service, um, you know, to others, that doesn't mean that you, you know, aren't like, you know, taking care of yourself and that you drop everything, but like actually, um, I don't know, just actually wanting to, um, make that difference and, and, you know, do that research or take that next step um, is going to really help you excel in your career, you know, finding something that you're passionate about. Um, and I guess finally, like one thing I always think of um, is, is kind of like taking risks, right? Um, you know, being open to 
uh, new ideas, you know, trying new things, suggest, suggesting new um, things, you know, speaking up um, can, I think, be something that helps as well. Great. Um, Nora or Dr. J, do you either of you have any advice to leave our, our listeners with? Yeah, I would say be your own advocate. If you know you want to achieve something, have that confidence in yourself. Um, that that woman and being not necessarily just anybody, right? Like when people look at you and you think, oh, you're too young to do this. You don't have enough notches in your belt to achieve. Don't let any of that stop you. You truly can achieve what you want. And like Kelly said, find that good mentor. Um, goal set, set your goals and know what you want to attain and give yourself a timeline. Like these are my short-term goals. These are my long-term goals. This is how I'm going to get there. Um, make that path for you and you can conquer it all. And I think that's really important to one, really know what you want by writing it down and two, how are you going to achieve it and find yourself a mentor. It doesn't have to be a mentor in your field. It just has to be somebody who's accomplished something very similar to what you want to accomplish, whether it be a leadership position or a certain career choice, whatever it may be. But I think it's really important to learn from others' experiences I know I wouldn't have been able to be here truly without my mentors because a lot of, you never learn the business side of medicine, right? You learn how to be a doctor in med school, but you don't learn the business side and field like REI or any other field that once you step outside the medical bracket, there's a business part to medicine that you have to learn. And Nora, do you have any advice before we, we hop off? Yeah, sure. Um, try to do your best to encourage yourself. Do not stop at being a mother or responsible of a child or a home. Uh, all women can do everything in a perfect way. Just uh, do your best and do not stop and uh, do more and more to, uh, for your career. Thanks. That was all very good advice. Um, I hope that our viewers today um, got some great insight into what it's like to be a female in healthcare. And um, I thank you guys all for joining us today. Um, if anybody has any questions about scheduling rotations or even, you know, um, doing a rotation with Dr. J virtually or in person, you can email our advisors at advisors at amopportunities.org. Thank you guys. Can I take a quick picture? Thank you. Yeah, of course. Okay. Hold on, let me see if I can get this to work. Uh, okay, maybe I'm doing a bad job at this. Okay, I got it. I don't know where I was looking, so I'm sorry if it's bad. <laughs> oh, you're totally fine. Thank you guys again for all taking time out of your busy schedule. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye. Bye.